at supersonic speeds. The heavier debris fell back to the ground, turning into colossal pyroclastic flows. It was sort of like a hurricane made up of uh, 800 degree ash and pumice and hot gases. Just wipes things out completely. For miles, these lethal rivers of ash and gas cooked animals alive and brushed forests aside like twigs. They extend actually outside of Yellowstone into Idaho and into the Teton region. Some of this material flowed down and actually covered parts of the floor of Jackson Hole. So the, these things extend tens of miles away from the actual eruption location. For days, the Yellowstone volcano continued to heave tons of molten debris into the air and devastated the nearby terrain. Then, across the caldera, another colossal explosion. Then, another. Eruption after eruption began shooting more and more lava and pulverized rock into the air. Typically, when these eruptions begin, they begin at a single vent, and the event may then get larger, moving out along some sort of a fracture system. Yellowstone had turned into a super eruption. Its devastation would reach around the world. Yellowstone's last super eruption occurred 640,000 years ago. It started as a single massive volcano, but soon turned into a series of eruptions, exploding with the full force of a supervolcano. The entire sequence of pyroclastic explosions that formed the Yellowstone caldera may have taken as little as two weeks to happen. Pyroclastic flows slashed across the landscape, obliterating thousands of square miles. Separate clouds of ash fused into a massive column of smoke. Winds drove it across the country, darkening the sky for hundreds of miles. During the eruption of all this material, that's when the caldera would have started forming. In a final massive display of nature's fury, hundreds of square miles of mountain dropped thousands of feet into the pit of roiling magma. The Gallatin Range and the Madison Range and the Mount Washburn Range to the north continued somewhere into the Yellowstone region. These mountain ranges were destroyed. Now, when I say destroyed, I don't mean they were blowing the smithereens into the atmosphere. Much of it just, then just fell back into the magmatic system, just fell back into the cauldron, if you wish, of the caldera itself. We're talking about mountains that might be 12,000 feet high uh, that are now, uh, the ground surface is on the order of eight to 9,000 feet high. So. 3,000 foot of mountain that is no longer there. Finally, after perhaps weeks of constant activity, the Yellowstone volcano subsided. But the devastation was far from over. A global disaster was about to begin. Two and a half trillion tons of sterile volcanic ash drifted with the winds and buried 2,000 square miles of the North American plains, destroying much of the continent's plant life. The volcanic ash that's ejected high up into the atmosphere and then falls many, many miles away, that goes as far as Louisiana and some of the states along the Mississippi River. So quite an ash cloud. The lighter particles remained in the air for more than a year, forcing temperatures to plunge across the hemisphere. It acts as a veil and cuts out the sunlight. And so it cools the climate below. I think there was certainly have been climatic changes due to Yellowstone. We estimated three to, three to five degrees Celsius drop in temperature, which is quite severe on a global basis. Five degrees was enough to kill off much of the tropical plant life across the globe. Over the next year, animals died from lack of food as the ash continued to block out the sun. It took years for the planet to recover for sunlight to reach the Earth's surface, for plants to push through the layers of ash, for animals to repopulate the continent. This Yellowstone eruption 640,000 years ago changed the face of North America. But that wasn't the only super eruption to ever strike the area. Besides the three calderas found near Yellowstone Park, Geologists have discovered a series of eruptions and super eruptions that extend back 16 million years. 
there have been a series of volcanic eruptions similar to those that occur at Yellowstone. And there are all sorts of calderas that are preserved uh, in the Snake River Plain in Idaho and extending back into Nevada. To date, 15 calderas of more than 140 large eruptions have been mapped. They create a trail running northeast to southwest and are an indication of what geologists call a hotspot. A hotspot is a portion of the Earth's mantle that contains a massive pool of partly molten rock. There is an area within the Earth's mantle, deep underneath where we live, that is molten and it's uh, causing a lot of heat to rise towards the surface and that heat causes melting in the crust and so we get uh, large magma chambers. From time to time, as the pressures build, the magma works its way to the surface and explodes. There are 20 or 30 hotspots around the Earth's globe, such places as Hawaii and Iceland. These are long-lived zones of active volcanism. The Hawaiian Islands, for example, were created one by one over the millennia by an underwater volcano. Though it appears as if the volcano had moved along the Earth's surface, in reality, the area of molten rock has remained relatively stationary. It is the Earth's crust which has moved. The same is true for the Yellowstone hotspot. Above its magma chamber, the North American plate is slowly sliding to the southwest about an inch a year. With each new eruption, a caldera is formed and appears to be further to the north. We find calderas all the way back into northern Nevada, and it's possible that there have been as many as 50 eruptions just as big as some of the ones that have come out of Yellowstone. With a history of multiple cataclysmic eruptions, Yellowstone is becoming the most studied supervolcano in the world and its hundreds of yearly earthquakes, thousands of geysers, and massive magma chamber make it one of the most geologically active regions. This thing is a breathing system, and it's a dynamic system. So I call it a living, breathing, shaking caldera. At the heart of these super eruptions is thought to be a mantle plume, an upwelling of molten rock rising from deep within the Earth. But no one could be sure. Recently, however, scientists have been using extremely sensitive monitoring systems to capture data from earthquakes centered around the world. The data has helped create the first 3D image of the source of Yellowstone's power. Once we put out an array of seismographs with sufficient resolutions, like getting a high resolution CAT scan, we saw that this thing was going off laterally about 150 kilometers to the northwest and it is basically coming up from a depth of about 600 kilometers. Yellowstone's magma source begins 450 miles below the surface, and surprisingly, not directly under the park. But 150 miles away beneath the Montana-Idaho border. It was totally unexpected and would, would not fit into anyone's textbooks or classic ideas. As the research continues, scientists are realizing how little they really know about the Yellowstone volcano. Since humans haven't seen an eruption of this magnitude, we're somewhat challenged to know exactly how the systems work. One thing is known for sure. If Yellowstone erupts again, pyroclastic flows will destroy everything near the volcano, and its ash cloud would overwhelm humanity across the globe and predicting its eruption could be a matter of life and death. The ash from the last three Yellowstone eruptions would fill the Grand Canyon.